We have a very special guest, Nick Green. He is a horticulturalist at Nick Green's LLC. Now, Nick started his career growing cannabis as an apprentice grower for a hydroponic shop. Now, a little history about Nick. In 2010, Nick moved to Chicago, or back to Chicago, growing produce for Blue Star Produce, where he perfected his compost tea recipes and became a pioneer in organic microgreens production. Now, in 2014, Nick created the microgreens program at Farmed Here, building its first NFT systems, creating crop and lighting recipes. Really awesome stuff Nick's been doing. One thing also Nick is passionate about is educating a new generation of controlled environment farmers and has created many internship opportunities for at-risk youth in urban Chicago areas. So I'm very proud to have Nick on the line today that we're going to learn more about vertical farming from Nick Greens. Hey, Nick, thanks for coming on the show today. Hey, thanks for having me, Patrick. You know, it's great to meet people on LinkedIn, especially during the COVID-19 crisis. I think I'm meeting a lot of new colleagues on LinkedIn that I will probably meet in person once an event or something does happen in person. Uh, but I really think it's cool, the power of LinkedIn and, and what's happening. Yes, yes, yes. And along with all these other technology meeting rooms, and uh, I, I, I counted on my cell phone that I think I have nine different uh, meeting apps on my cell phone. And from before is probably one or two, right? Now you got all the different media, social media apps tied in with the uh, social connection apps, right? Zoom, Skype, um, what What else can you think of? What are some other ones that you have? I'm trying to think. WebEx. WebEx, Wova. Yeah, there's tons yeah. of them, right? There's, we can try to name a bunch of them, but I do agree. But what I thought was cool is, and what caught my eye, and everybody has their own unique way of establishing themselves on LinkedIn or any of their social media platform. But some of the articles that I started reading that you were posting were kind of the benefits of greenhouse farming. You kind of went through about vertical farming. And a lot of these posts caught my eye um, because as I was in, I'm a supporter of the Juice Plus world, uh, they have the vertical farm. And as my co-author of the Millennial Boom, Hans Fenzel, He's always posting pictures on his social media of his vertical farm that he has inside of his house. He's got these tower gardens in his basement that he grows year round, right? So he's constantly doing vertical farming. But what is that to our industry, the produce and supply chain industry during COVID-19? Um, could greenhouse farming or vertical farming may have helped? I mean, what's your kind of thought process towards the vertical farming and greenhouse farming? Yes, yes, we could help. Um, but we, we can't fully help because all these farms are not at its optimal uh, uh, um, scale just yet. Um, these farms can produce, um, they can produce profits, but the margins are very, very small, uh, which, which uh, it, it doesn't attract investors, it's not a secure investment, uh, just all of those kind of things uh, as well. That's very cool though, and I heard, from um, a buddy of mine from the Orlando Business Network has a friend that was in the military that owns a greenhouse in San Diego that actually got some of that farmers to families box deal because they are considered a grower in the farming community. So they were able to one, any excess or any greenhouse fruit veggies that they had, now they were able to really help the USDA and help people in poverty and in needs uh, that get now this farmers to families box. Did you see that at all? Yes, yes, I have. I actually just have seen that. I I help a company called Garfield Produce, a company in Chicago. Uh, they specifically target a, a certain neighborhoods in need uh, and do a very very good job at what they do. Um, and I've been helping them out. And they they went from working with restaurants and then to just one restaurant. And then now they turned it into this program and now all of their stuff is going to the neighborhood. Um, and it's a great thing to see right now. So what could we expect? I mean, think about it. If you're a restaurant, right? You were closed during all this and then you reopened uh, to start doing curbside deliveries, but you're just in time inventory just shortened a little bit more within the supply chain because you're not holding inventories. And I heard a, a bunch of comments throughout LinkedIn saying, do you think it's a good idea for restaurants and new outlets, right? New industries to start vertical farming and greenhouse farming 
So if there are things that happen or disrupt the supply chain that they're able to supply their own needs? I would say more of a partner up and as opposed to doing it on your own. All right, let's imagine you're that restaurant owner, right? You already have so much going on in your business that you have to adjust to. Uh, to, to start throwing learning vertical farming in the game would just not do well for a restaurant. So team up with some professionals in the neighborhood or team up with a, a, a big company. Um, I'm going to see more partnerships, I'd say, successfully uh, do this. Um, um, I'm not saying that no restaurant can't take on a, a project like this, but there's a lot, uh, um, a lot of time required to start in a farm. I bet. I mean, as a, I would say as a farming community, right? I mean, I deal with a lot of farmers. I mean, to deal with a normal crop, right? And the people that I deal with are citrus farmers or onion farmers, and I see what they go through and what it costs just to be able to be a normal farmer. And I know vertical farming is a heck of a lot different. I think even a normal farmer would have a, I would say not a tough, but a decent transition going into vertical farming, wouldn't you say? Yes, yes, yes. I, I, I agree. They, they will have a, a decent transition uh, to vertical farming. Uh, I mean, with me, uh, you know, I like to say that uh, farming is not a human error. It's a lack of procedures on what you're doing and what, uh, uh, what stages you're, 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 you're harvesting at. That makes sense. So what benefits do, though, do we see from greenhouse farming and vertical farming? I mean, if we're an old school farmer and we're like, you know what, we don't want to partner up with a greenhouse. I've seen people that have, right? I've seen nurseries, you know, within the citrus industry, they grow grapefruit year round in Texas. And I've seen that, you know, grapefruit is now pretty plentiful during Texas at certain times of the year. But what are some benefits of greenhouse and vertical farming? I mean, mean, there's tons of benefits. I mean, first off, um, control of environment, right? Uh, When you're growing in certain parts of the world, I mean, these environments are very uh, what can happen to the climate is very unpredictable right now at this time. Um, so being able to control that uh, and, and being able to change it on a, on, on a drop of a dime, um, I think that's the importance there. Uh, that's just one importance there, right? Uh, being able to change that. Yeah. And what's funny is too, is I was reading an article the other day about that farm to fork, right? And it's so funny because not a lot of these companies are farm to fork. And if you were to look at vertical farming, as I've done a little bit of the history, I mean, you start off with the seed, right? I mean, you start off with the seedling, you have to root it, you got to put it into this vertical farm, right? So you're pretty much going from the seed all the way to the smile, as my friend Lori Taylor, the produce mom says, I mean, because that's what it looks like to me, right? It would, would that be accurate? Yes, yes, and and uh, to to add to more of that, so so just being said that uh, knowing your farmer is gonna be very important, and not organic. The word organic will definitely not be there no more, and it'd be more local uh, as a very strong point because local means you do know your farmer, and that's what it, in the vertical farming juice plus world, um, and I and my family takes juice plus. So in that world, those farmers show up to the, all those shows and they want to meet everybody because a lot of the vertical farmers in that world are their own vertical farmers, right? They buy this little setup. It goes in there, you know, could go in the corner of your, uh, of your house or of the back, you know, backyard somewhere. Um, and I think that a lot of those farmers get really personal with those people because they want them to know the trust factor. They want them to know the food safety factor. And that was gonna lead to my next question. How do we look at food safety when it comes to vertical farming? Now I've been in greenhouses and uh, I know that it's very, you gotta wear the boots, you go through the air compressed uh, um, doors. I mean, what is this food safety process within the greenhouse and vertical farming? How does that compare to a normal packing house? Uh, It's gonna be, um, we're we're gonna, I'm, I like to call it the terms and give it a laboratory setting, right? So we're going to treat uh, going inside a grow room, going inside a greenhouse, going inside any controlled environment, uh, like a laboratory setting. So uh, anything, any procedures uh, of, of um, uh, protection that anybody would wear in a lab setting, you're going to wear inside a grow room uh, or a greenhouse. 
So a heck of a lot different from the produce industry now in the processing industry. That is because a lot of these processing facilities, uh, they're all, just like you said, you're, you're pretty much suiting up. Like you're going in uh, to a nuclear bomb zone. I say like a lab, like there's no, this is a full clean room, right? So you'll have everything over your head even um, with this suit and the boots. The packing facilities are not that way. Uh, they are getting a little bit more advanced with COVID. They put washing stations, you know, on the outside of the packing line before you walk in. You know, you have your coat hanging racks before you walk in the doors now. So there's a lot of things that are happening uh, before. And remember, everybody has food safety scales too, right? I mean, someone that gets scores at 84% and scores at 95% can still sell to the same people, right? I mean, they just have corrective action plans and things like that. So it is. it sounds like there is a huge difference, and that probably is a difference in costs and different measures as well uh, when doing vertical and greenhouse farming. But one of the articles that I saw uh, that you had posted one time that I thought was very cool is when it said, what are some benefits of greenhouse farming? And it was fresh cut flowers 365 days a year. You know, think about it. Could you do that with a commercial crop such as, citrus or cherries could you build a greenhouse directly on them and have a product 365 days a year or would it still maintain its growing region like it was outside like you know navels go from october to may would navels be able to grow year round inside of a greenhouse or would they still grow for that certain period uh yes you can do this this is being done uh by somebody already in the midwest uh, that has uh, green greenhouses, I want to say. But the key, the key, the key thing to being able to grow uh, citrus all year round in any climate is to have thermal, thermal uh, 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 cooling and heating, right? Um, because you to heat up and cool a, a greenhouse is very expensive. Um, so growing fruits in it really does not make sense economically. But if you had uh, help from Earth and you were uh, heating and cooling it with the help from Earth, then yes, you, you, this could be done at a very fraction of the cost and makes it worth the while that we can see uh, greenhouses in Minnesota growing mangoes. Um, yes, yes, this could be done. Can it be done efficiently? Yes especially with the technology now, uh, it's just going to require a lot of upfront money uh, to get this going. That's very cool. And I think that it should probably start to happen. So how would that go by? Are there more greenhouses and more vertical farming? I would say uh, farmers coming up because I mean, in, I'm in Tampa now, but I was in the central Valley of California and I know we saw a lot of greenhouses and I know they did. Uh, but how would a citrus farmer or a cherry farmer or someone benefit from this? Um, would it be by they would be able to control their growing? Would it be that they get to harvest more uh, fruit? And you know, think about this in an operations standpoint. If we were to partner with someone, how do you go about doing that? Because I know a lot of times, if I'm a I'm a citrus guy, I wouldn't even think how to start contacting a greenhouse and start to start that relationship. Well, if if you're providing everything to the plants, right, and 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 say the technology gets better, so it becomes, you know, for a fraction of the cost, we're able to give lighting and, 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 and the right climate to any uh, variety of plant, then yes, we can, right now, the technology that we have right now, we can grow tomato plants for 11 months straight. Um, and the only reason why we don't go further than 11 months is because then now we're starting to really, really go up that, uh, a path of, uh, of dealing with pests. They're getting a little bit older. Uh, you just got to really, really dial it in and, and it just becomes not worth it. So we restart them every 11 months. Uh, the tomato uh, um, uh, trees, I should call them, they end up becoming 40 foot plants. Uh, so imagine if we can do this with tomatoes right now, like I said, it's just very cost efficient to heat and cool the greenhouse during the, the hot and, uh, and cold months especially if you're in like, uh, for instance, uh, the Midwest, uh, say Chicago, for instance. Yeah, but it could be done. That, that is cool. So yeah, now let's talk a little bit about some opportunity, right? Because I always say we'd like to give our guests, our listeners, some opportunities 
on you know what to look for, how to look for. So we're going to give some of our listeners some you know some advice, some opportunities within vertical farming or greenhouse farming. Nick, what kind of advice could you give us? Just two things. Uh, well, first off, what is what is your goal? Or if if you're trying to be that uh, big giant brand uh, in this industry, I would say you need a lot of money. Just trying to be the mom and pop, uh, the mom and pop kind of lifestyle a brand, then I would say uh, you have a chance, but you but you're gonna work really really hard, and the rewards are not gonna be as grand. Uh, but the rewards of of being seeing them smiles on people uh, sometimes balance it. So it's all on on what you want to choose, and uh, there is a lot of bigger uh, big money involved now. Um, so that's, that's, you know, you got, you got a lot of competition now, uh, fighting for these, uh, uh, these little niche markets. I agree. I actually like that. It's a good idea. You know, it's funny. I was just thinking while you were saying that finger limes came to mind because a lot of people grow, well, not a lot, a lot of people see these finger limes and they're very small crops. And I could imagine if someone was to get these into a greenhouse, right. And be able to produce not more, but better quality, better quantity of them that it could work. And that was like, right as I'm thinking about what you're saying about how to, you know, analyze this opportunity and it's going to cost money, but you got to think who, who's got the product. Okay. We found the product. Now go find a greenhouse. You can collectively put this thing together and find someone to help you grow your business and it will help you grow theirs. Right. So, um, yeah, that, that's really cool. So, so Nick, Listen, if anybody wants to learn more about, you know, horticulture, vertical farming, greenhouse farming, I know you've been blogging about a lot about it. Um, I know you, ha you have another organization that you operate and work with. Um, but how can they, how can our listeners get a hold of you if they want to learn more and reach out to you? Well, there's uh, many ways. I'm on all the platforms under Nick Greens. Um, there is also a Facebook group called uh, the Microgreens Group. Uh, and basically, I've been running that group um, and the YouTube channel, Nick Green's YouTube channel as well, um, and all the platforms we're weekly uh, posting to as well. And and then we we got a blog post every week. And yeah, just just trying to provide uh, the best educational uh, product that I can provide out there uh, without having to charge uh, any any money. Yeah, that's what it's about right now. I hate seeing some of these extra charges for things that should be free. Even like the podcast, my goal is to get real talk with real people and good information out to them, right? So I, I agree with you. I love what you're doing. I appreciate you coming on the show today and I look forward to having you back. So thanks again, Nick.